see. Hopefully that worked. It showed up as a safe link, which I don't know why it does that. Let me see. There he is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Welcome, Dr. Shabazz. All right. So then I'm going to go ahead. Um, this is amazing. All of us are here. I'm so, um, I'm so happy about that. So I'm going to go ahead and call the meeting to order as soon as I can find my agenda. Okay, so welcome. I'm calling to order at 2.35 p.m. the March 28th meeting of the African Heritage Reparation Assembly. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. Please see instructions below. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, so welcome everyone. And uh, let's just quickly uh, go over what we're gonna be reviewing today. So as promised, we're gonna try to keep this to an hour um, and we're gonna focus most of our time today continuing our discussion about community engagement and the community survey, as well as uh, launching an Engage Amherst project page uh, for our assembly. And then because of the deadline that's approaching on the Mass Humanities grant that we spoke about previously, I want to bring that to our attention and see what we'd like to do for that. Um, we do have some meeting minutes that are uh, ready to be approved. But I didn't get them to you guys in time. And okay, <laughs> that was the question. Out. Okay, perfect. I finished them on Saturday, so. That's no problem. We'll do that next time. I kind of had that sense, but since it was on the agenda, I just thought I'd mention it. Um, okay, good. So before we get into it, there aren't any attendees right now, so we don't need to hold a public comment at this moment. Um, but before we sort of jump into things, are there any questions or comments? Okay, good. Um, so Yvonne and Dr. Shabazz, um, you, by the way, Dr. Shabazz, you're showing up as me, which is really sweet. <laughs> Um, so, uh, we talked last week, we started discussing the, um, a, a survey, a community survey. Actually, we may have been discussing this for a couple weeks now. And I presented some objectives that we worked on together. Actually, Dr. Shabazz, I think you were there for the very beginning of that meeting. Um, and then we talked about me checking in with the Dunahue Institute, who we contracted with to do the Black Census, to see what thoughts and ideas they might have about developing a survey and whether that was something they could help us with. So I have reports to offer back to the assembly. I did have a chance to have that conversation. Um, but what I also wanna share in this same context is the Black Census is almost completed, um, which is really exciting. And I did get, because I got to meet with Carrie uh, in person. So she was able to show me um, some highlights. It was really interesting. And she, if all goes well and everyone's okay with this, she will be able to come and present um, potentially at our next meeting. Um, to present the findings and share the visuals with us and take questions and all that kind of stuff. And then we can really dig into how we want to, what we want to do with that information. Um, but I did want to share that piece of things. Um, so I'm going to share my screen so we can bring up the objectives one more time. Um, so Yvonne can look at them and um, so everyone can just look at them again. Um, let's see here. Hmm. I don't 
know if I'm doing this right. Let's see. Yeah. All right. So can everyone see that? Yeah. Okay. So I, based on our discussion last week, I reworked this a little bit, and this was something that I sent to Carrie at the Dunahue Institute prior to our conversation. Um, so starting with the first objective um, to, of determining the community's understanding of the meaning of reparations. So how do community members define reparations and what do community members know about the history of reparations in the US? And really it doesn't have to be limited to the US and probably shouldn't be. Um, and then determine the community's understanding of the historical context of racial injustice in Amherst. So now this brings us from a broader discussion about reparations to what is the local um, question here and, and the historical context. And so what do community members know about the injustices and um, crimes that have been perpetuated against people of African heritage? Have community members read any of the resources on our website, including some of our reports? Um, what reactions do community members have to these resources? What other knowledge of racial injustice in Amherst and uh, lived experience? And then gathering perspectives about truth and reconciliation. So what perspectives do community members have about the truth and reconciliation process? Who should be involved in that process? And what level of interest do community members have to engage in the process? Um, and then, of course, using the survey to promote um, our charge as an assembly online and at community events. So it's a tool to engage the community. And we talked about developing a stakeholder group that could be sort of our lead folks to be recruited to help them to help us distribute this survey to sub communities within the broader Amherst community. Um, and I think that's a really important part of the process. They may also help to translate the survey when necessary, and then to serve as interview participants and recruiters for additional interviews, oral history stuff. Um, and last week we reviewed um, the conversation I had with Brianna, who's the communications director at the town, um, she recommended that we do a survey monkey and then we can, um, we, we viewed the age and dementia friendly project, um, on engage Amherst, which if you haven't had a chance to look at it, you should definitely take a look. It's really great. Um, so that's sort of an overview of what we discussed last time. And then I went ahead and had a conversation with Donahue, but before I report on that, I just wanna see if there are any questions um, from anybody about that so far or comments or, okay, good, okay. So I had a really interesting conversation with Curry, um, who has a lot of experience developing surveys. Um, she's developed surveys locally. Um, I believe she's just finishing up on a survey she worked with Wayfinders. Um, Wayfinders is the organization that was recently identified or chosen as a developer for like 70 plus affordable housing units here in Amherst. Um, and she has also had now some experience working at the Dunahue Institute. And one of the things, and this is important for Yvonne and Dr. Shabazz to know because this came up last week, um, Alexis actually brought this forward, is the question of who is working with us and are we looking to find people of African heritage to participate in this work? Um, like for example, if we were to partner with the Dunahue Institute on the survey. And so I just wanted to um, highlight that point and say that that is something that Carrie and I discussed. But overall, um, what I got out of that conversation is given the subject matter that we're dealing with here and given the fact that it is critical 
that we reach into every corner and nook and cranny of this community to talk to them about this. Um, her suggestion was that we may want to think about leading with focus groups that would then guide us and inform us on the process of developing the survey that would go out to the broader community. And one potential structure we talked about is if we want to go with the plan of identifying leaders in various sub communities to then ultimately distribute a survey and have conversations with the sub communities about um, the work that we're doing, then we could start by identifying those folks and having focus groups with those folks um, to gain feedback on how the survey should be designed and what sorts of questions should be on it. Like we talked last week that the age and uh, age friendly and dementia survey was 70 something questions. I know many people who have taken it now. It seems like it's a very thorough um, survey, but is a 70 question survey what we're after or, um, you know, and what sorts of questions do we really want to be asking? What are we trying to get out of this? So I really liked the idea of um, identifying stakeholders and then having some focus groups first to help us to guide this process. And I, I will say that um, that's what the Board of Health did. And I participated in one of those listening sessions. And I thought it was really, um, there were some flaws to it potentially, but it was, um, it was a good process. And Jennifer, I see your hand is up. So please go ahead. Hi, I don't know where it is in the mix, but I know that the CREST program is going to have um, ambassadors in different communities that they're going to use to do something similar to get feedback about how the CREST program is doing and then also to kind of help engage folks in town. So that could be a possible way that, because we kind of do need to be able to support these individuals. We need to give them stipends and then they need to be able to give gifts cards for those who participate. Um, so that might be something that we could all kind of do together mm -hmm. and some either, you know, they can have them, you know, they can start with Crest and then take along, take on yours or vice versa, whichever comes first. But there are um, there's a pretty long list of folks who've already been identified that I can share with mm -hmm. the chair. I'd rather not share in the meeting because then I have to, you know, put people's names out there. But yeah, yeah, I really appreciate that. And just to clarify, the stipends are for the ambassadors, and the gift cards are offered for folks who respond, whether it be to the focus group or to a survey. Um, and I know that the bid has, I think offered gift cards, maybe the chamber, I have to look. Um, chamber. But was it the chamber? Okay. Um, so we could try to see what might be available um, for our work as well. Oh, and this really brings me to kind of another topic but it's very much related that I want this body to discuss. And Dr. Shabazz, I see your hand is up. It's blending in there. So please go ahead. Well, uh, the I'll say the feeling I have just looking at the design of, of what we're seeking to know through the survey at this point, I don't, I would like to hear a little more discussion or rationale for the needs of focus groups to inform the, the, the survey. The, the way I see the goals that, we, that, that have been gone over in terms of the kinds of things we wanna know at this stage is, um, is sufficient to develop, I think, a set of questions. We're not asking at this point in, in this survey for, for example, ideas about what, what harms should be addressed or what ways in which um, 
what kinds of reparative justice efforts. That's not what we're seeking right now. We're seeking what do you know about the process? What do you um, you know? What do you think about the process? Um, you know whether you've you've consulted certain materials to understand the the basis of this process. And to me, I think that can be that can you know one can develop a set of questions out of that that can give us um, give us that sense from the community at this point. Um, if we were trying to do something more extensive, like getting at the harms that that uh, that people are seeing, and and getting at what prioritization of those harms, or getting at um, you know what kind, what ways in which we should repair, which I don't think we ought to be doing at this stage in the process. But if we were doing that, then I could see the perhaps the step of of looking at uh, of focus groups and looking at other things to develop the types of questions to ask. But since we're not at that point, we're not at that stage with that with those other kinds of questions. Um, I think I think it's possible to go ahead and draft. A, a, a very uh, succinct uh, survey that gets at the objectives we've gone over um, without, you know, and, and able to kind of move expeditiously, begin to move expeditiously on it. That's just me. But if there are other viewpoints on the assembly about, you know, you know, taking a, a, a little more deliberative approach, then I'm, I'm open to, to being persuaded on that. Thank you, Dr. Shabazz. Are there other thoughts on that? Yes, or? I, I agree with what you're saying, Emilcar, but I would like to um, for us to think about when you're constructing a survey, uh, the questions themselves are very, really, very, very important because uh, those generate the kind of information that you one. So the questions have to be constructed very carefully. So I can see the value of a limited set of focus groups, which would help us to develop the questions in such a way that they are targeted and they get clarified through those participants who uh, participate in the focus group. And that's what I see the value of a focus group is. It's only to give us the ability to sharpen the kinds of questions we have and to clarify the kinds of questions we have so that when we do do a full on survey, we have a, a really a good high degree of confidence in terms of how individuals may respond to those questions. Thank you, Irv. Other thoughts on that? Okay. Um, if I'm just reflecting back on what I've heard Dr. Shabazz and Dr. Rhodes say, it sounds like um, we don't necessarily need to draw this out into you know, a multi-month focus group prior to developing questions, but that we may want to begin to build the survey, develop the questions, and then have some focus groups to, as Dr. Rhodes said, sharpen the questions um, and make sure that we're really clarifying what it is we're looking for. Um, and I think that's a really good compromise personally. Um, and I'm completely on board with that, um, but I would like to hear from Yvonne and Hala and Alexis as well. Okay. Um, well, we'll come back then for a second to that. Oh, yes, Dr. Shabazz, please. I guess what I would follow up with to say, uh, what I'd recommend um, is we take a stab uh, or however we, we move this process forward. We take a stab at, at writing out a set of questions from the objectives we've articulated 
and then have those as a basis to test out on the focus group or whatever you would say. But just to come at the focus group with broad point prompts from our our the the objectives thing we went over, I just don't think I, I think that's going to drag things out. But if we came with questions developed from that objective sheet and then and then see what the response is to the questions. Do they are they clear? Do they, you know, um, you know, are they asking, you know, what we need them to ask? I think then it could make the focus group perhaps a little more pointed in in giving us back what we need. Yeah. And that was, by the way, Curry definitely encouraged us to try whatever it is we have out on folks so that might be that's a great solution yes Yvonne I'm just wondering you know I think that um it has to be a productive time the focus groups and education is and knowledge has to be before and in you know and I don't think that we want to pick and choose and correct me if I'm wrong, we're not picking and choosing who goes into these focus groups or are we vetting people beforehand? That's my first question. And then the other question is, I, which I don't agree with, I think it should be open, but I think the folks who come into the room need to be aware and knowledgeable of some of the broader aspects of, of the committee and reparations so that we get right at to the information. So, you know, I know there's probably, and you could ask, um, what's her name, Carrie? Mm -hmm. Carrie, yes. I, I have met like 10 Carries in the last like two weeks. <laughs> I don't know, it must be some Carrie kind Spencer. Of, I'm just saying, everybody's <laughs> named Carrie or Kelly. I'm so <laughs> confused. Um, but um, I think that, you know, uh, Car Carrie might know more about like how we vet people to be in these focus groups. And I mean, some, I, like I said, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not um, encouraging there to be um, exclusivity because that's not what we want. Mm -hmm. But we do want folks who are willing to contribute and are productive in the, in the, in the mix. And so I don't know if that means a little like pre-survey or a application process or some kind of way to know who's in the room beforehand and get them some documents they can read beforehand so that when they come into the room, they're all set to go and ready to go. Um, I think that would go a long way to making those times really productive. I also want to say that the I mean, there is two and we can have a conversation about what is the best way to have this, but is it that focus sometimes location is important? So are they all happening in the same place or are we doing them in different places so that that will attract uh, different populations, you know what I mean, to the to the actual focus groups? And are they in person or are is everything by Zoom? I think that's the other that's the other issue is there's probably folks who don't may not want to come in person and they want to have it by Zoom. So I know those are all sort of the logistical questions, but um, I think that if we tackle some of those, it might go a long way to us having some really productive um, data and information. Absolutely. Those are really um, important aspects. And in fact, um, there was a technical term for the sort of pre uh, interview or application, like it's a pre-screening that can happen for folks. Um, and I agree that um, providing some sort of materials in advance to those folks is really helpful. Um, I think the question of location is absolutely critical for any sort of focus group um, for so many reasons. But um, I, I, so if, if we wanted to move forward with trying to build some questions, um, would you prefer to try to do that all together or would you prefer there to be a subcommittee um, that of two members that works on that and then brings it back to the larger assembly? Um, Can we you just know, not? Call it a subcommittee because then, yeah. <laughs> then you have, we to, have to stuff. <laughs> yeah. And if there's only two people, then that's that's fine. Yeah. Okay. 
So the options would be that two of us, um, and in fact, three of us, including Jennifer, really. So it could be up to two of us plus Jennifer, um, or we could do a workshop for the whole assembly. So like our next meeting could be a workshop where all of us are participating. We take the objectives and we start working on some questions. So I'm curious, just from a process perspective, what the assembly members feel would be the most efficient and effective way of getting at this so we can stop talking about it and start working on it. <laughs> um, so any thoughts on that would be, yes, Dr. Shabazz. You're muted. So the... Um... You know, the idea of, of, of starting on it is fine. I just had a question about whether um, opening a, a Google Doc or a Doc on a drive that everybody could have a chance to look at. Is that a OML issue or, or what? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, I think I would have to get clarification on this. I think if we started it together um, in a public meeting, I don't know. I have to really, I would have to get that. I would have to get clarification, Jennifer. I don't know if you have any experience with the, what did the community safety working group do when they developed their questions or the, or the, the human resources commission or anyone who you've. So usually things are assigned into a, you know, two or three people that work on it. And then it gets sent to the groups for their content for, for their input. And, and CSWG was using me as that portal. So if you were gonna to respond to something, Dr. Shabazz, it was going through me, but I don't. I think that that's borderline LM, uh, open meeting <laughs> violations too. Wow. Um, so it's really, I would think that a working document, I mean, I think that if everybody wanted to give their input or their questions to you, and then you wanted to consolidate them and then present them at the next meeting, that that would be fine. Actually, yes, that is actually fine to do. So if, for example, everybody on the assembly sent just Jennifer and I their ideas, look at the objectives and send questions, send ideas um, in any one of those categories, then Jennifer and I can organize them and start to, to actually build something coherent. And then that can be brought back to the next meeting and we can use that as the starting point um, to really get it solidified. Does that sound like a plan that we could agree to? And maybe what we do is um, like if we want the black census to be presented at our next meeting if we're going to keep the cadence of meeting once a week then we could have the black census presented at our next meeting and we can put this off to the following meeting which would give everybody two weeks um to send in their questions um and give Jennifer and I time to put it together and she could even probably start getting things into survey monkey and sort of setting things up. So we have an idea visually of what things would look like and things like that. Um, does that sound like a, a good plan process wise? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thank you, Hala. Yeah. And I'll check with Alexis. Um, Dr. Rhodes, does that work for you? Uh, that works. Okay, excellent. So um, just if whatever questions and even let's say like Dr. Shabazz, let's say you want to start a Google document for your own stuff. You can share that with Jennifer and I, like as long as we're not sharing it with the whole group, I think we're okay to do that. Whatever format works, you can text me, you can call me, you can email Jennifer and I, whatever way you want to get the information over to us um, is fine. Okay, great. Um, so just one other thing I want to plant the seed to think about um, is about our budget. And something I've been thinking about a lot is and we talked about this in the beginning, like 
we're going to need money to do things we need right but we have this but this fund that's been established it's has two hundred and six thousand dollars, maybe a little more in it from last year's holdover that Paul gave to us. Um, there are going to be, by the way, and this is actually not on the agenda today, so I don't know if I can. I'm going to leave that aside just in case for now, but um, I think it would be wise for us to think about of that two hundred and six thousand um, dollars, just from for our own sake internally and from the community's perspective, for us to split out x amount of dollars um, that maybe we're calling like an administrative budget or a working project budget or whatever it is we want to call it. So that it's very clear to our community that, and transparent, that we're not wanting to tap into reparative justice dollars haphazardly to do uh, work. We're delineating X amount of dollars for the work that we need to do out of that budget. And we're being really upfront and honest and clear about it. Um, and that way, when we do want to spend money on whatever things we're going to spend money on we and it doesn't mean that that has to be set in stone but i would just say for accounting purposes that we have that we break out a category now that is clearly for administrative purposes for our work um, and i'm curious what folks feel about that or think about that yes um or I think that we might want, when you say administrative purposes, we might want to define that, um, define define it in such a way that it's operational, mm -hmm. um, and that it's um, something that is really clear to the council who will have to vote on it. Yes, that is the word <laughs> word I was seeking. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> Yvonne. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's kind of what I was um, going to say as well. Maybe you want to come up with a specific budget of how the money is being used for administrative work. So if it's for copying or if it's for consultants, maybe, or if it's, you know, like be really specific about what it's being used for. And then, well, it's good too, because then we'll have a total. You know, I have a bottom total that says this is what the money is used for and this is the budget and and then it's all clear and clean, you know, no, no gray areas. Yes, exactly. Exactly. Okay. And, um, uh, Earth. Um, I, I'm, I'm as, uh, my hands up. Okay. <laughs> down now. Okay. Um, is, I'm going to be out of here in about three minutes. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Well, I'll think about then for our next, um, for our next meeting, we'll, I'll think more about that, but I just wanted to bring that out. So just to recap before Irv has to leave and we're going to talk about the mass humanities grant, um, we are going to between now and, um, can we just, Irv, before you have to leave, if we could confirm our dates, um, has this, is this time 2.30 on Mondays doable for folks if we do that on the 4th and the 11th? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah? As, as long, yeah, as long as they're consistent for me. Uh, okay. Then I, then I, then I know it's there. Otherwise, it just wreaks havoc with my calendar. Yeah, I have to figure something out. Um, so the fourth definitely is a thumbs up for two thirty on the fourth. Okay, the eleventh. Um, my son has an a, do a doctor's appointment, so meeting at three thirty would to four thirty would be better for me. Um, so I don't have to change. It's very difficult to change doctor's appointments these days. Um, so, but I know Alexis said that she I thought was in a class during that time but and that's I thought why we had done the 230 today so I'm I have to check with her about that but would 330 on the 11th be possible for folks I have a, a somewhat of a conflict on the 4th okay 
Okay, so I'm in a meeting from two until three o'clock. So I mean, oh. I could join at three. But Why don't I we do three? Before. Three? No, let's do yeah. And let's three o'clock on the fourth. Yeah, yeah, I'm busy yeah. till yeah. But I can clear my schedule from then on, on okay. on Mondays. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. So is everyone good for the fourth at three o'clock? Good. Great. Okay. And then on the 11th, um, we'll do 3.30, if that's okay, for one hour. Okay. I may not be able to, I won't be able to stay on the 11th uh, for a full hour if you start at 3.30. But you know, actually, I can start at three on the 11th because the appointment ends. And so why don't we actually, why don't we do um yeah the the fourth at three o'clock and the 11th at three o'clock does that work okay sure. all right and herb jumped off so i i think that would work for him though too okay that's great perfect. thank you perfect yeah all right so i want to just quickly i'm gonna quickly share my screen again to show you we talked about this a while back um Mass Humanities has grant a grant program happening. Um, Mass Humanities is the organization that's responsible for the reading of the Fre Frederick Douglass on the Common that some of you may have participated in, in various communities, they do that. Um, but the one that we were looking at is called Expand Massachusetts Stories. Um, and this is up to $20,000 um, that can be used for all of these different formats that they um, list here. So it could be used for oral histories. Um, I think initially we had talked about doing a documentary of uh, the assembly's work. Um, and 20,000, I, I think Alexis, um, 20,000 would go pretty a good way. And um, Yvonne, I know you have more experience than I do on this, but probably wouldn't cover everything, but it would, it would probably be a good <laughs> chunk for us. <laughs> um, so what we have to do here, if we want to pursue this, is we have to have a letter of inquiry into them. Um, by April 11th at midnight, close to midnight, 11.59 p.m. So I wanted to see if, one, if there is an assembly member that wants to tackle this and write the letter of inquiry to bring back to the group, a draft to bring back to the group, that would be fantastic. But I know everybody's very um, time crunch these days. So if nobody is available to do that, I could attempt something to bring back to you all um, for review um, and drafting together at that point. So I'm fine with either, but if you, if there is someone on the assembly that feels they'd be really well suited to do this, um, that would be fantastic and could do it in the timeline uh, that's here. Yes, Hala. I'm not sure if well suited, but definitely eagerly willing. Awesome. Okay. That would be fantastic. Um, and Yvonne, did you want to add to that? I don't, I mean, I'm willing to uh, add some expertise. I'm just so busy. I've, I've got a couple of really um, intensive things happening right now in my life, which makes it really difficult to say yes. But um, bef I mean, I'd love to work with Hala on it, but um, I'm concerned about the scope and the goal of this project that still yet needs to be determined. Um, this is talking about storytelling, oral histories. Um, that's a big undertaking. Mm -hmm. You know, I know initially we were talking more with the video about documenting process mm -hmm. and this, um, this uh, proposal, this um, grant is more, I think, more about a documentary that's, you know, um, not about documenting process, but more about the stories of residents, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's important, but I don't know how that fits into the scope of this project. So I think there needs to be some defining, mm -hmm. you know, first, uh, because that'll also define um, effort, <laughs> you know, like, like planning yeah. the project itself. 
you know, once we define what we're trying to get at, then, you know, that will also define, you know, how we kind of put everything together and how we plan and what the production means. Absolutely. And even writing the letter of intent, right? If we're not clear. Yeah, yes. absolutely. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Alexis. Um, yeah, this was actually something that I was going to bring up. Um, because when I saw this, and I'm, I was also thinking about, you know, in terms of how much labor it takes, it, I was thinking about um, micro content versus macro content or like pillars of content, right? And so I was thinking, you know, one smaller project could be something that's very intertwined with this process and with our survey, which is these oral histories. And the thing about these oral histories, which I agree that they're extremely important, they can really only be, you know, it's, it's not like we, you know, ask someone to say something and then we write it down. It no longer becomes an oral history anymore. So like, I know that there's ways that we can do either through podcast, like just with audio, like getting podcasting sort of style audio, or even just holding you know, just hosting those oral histories, I feel like that's a project in its own and could be added to a larger documentary project. But in this, in this, looking at this, I feel like we could just focus on that oral histories, which could, you know, they, yeah. So anyways, I, I, I was thinking about it in terms of that, of course, we didn't talk about it. And I, I think that this is great that we should define it. But I, I think even just for this, like, if we were to go with this, I feel like the oral histories and, and, getting those people like I, I think about the Yiddish Book Center like this, this is what they do all the time with um Jewish oral histories and so they have people come into their place and they just record them and they have them available for people to view all the time and so I don't like this seems like an amazing opportunity to do just that and I feel like that can add to a larger thing but I without me saying the same thing 500 times yes I feel like this could be a way for us to just focus on the oral histories I'm gonna be quiet now I, I think that is very wise and that sounds right on point from my perspective. Um, and knowing that um, from your experience, we could take sort of the micro content, as you said, and then put it into a more macro um, project, I think is, is great. Um, and so, you know, I, I think that Oh, Dr. Shabazz, I'm so sorry. Uh, your hand is up. Yes, please. Oh, go ahead. Finish your thought. I was just going to say that if two people, um, like, for example, if Hala and depending on whether, you know, I, I think Yvonne, what I heard you say is you're pretty busy, but you'd be willing to review something that sort of got together. So maybe if Hala and Alexis started sort of working on this together for the letter of intent and then... Um, I'm happy to jump on a meeting with them. I think the three of us together. Um, yes. My question is, I love that idea about micro and macro, um, but is this a different um, direction or focus for the committee? I think that's a good question, but I think that oral histories is going to be something that we're absolutely would be pursuing. Um, so I don't think it's like a totally off the rails different. Um, I think it's just doing something. I think, I think we're given kind of what we're doing, we're very likely to get awarded. Um, I think if we write a good letter of intent, so we don't want to miss the opportunity. And I do think that oral histories are something that we're going to be pursuing. Um, but maybe Dr. Shabazz is, has something to add to that. Okay, so um, I feel that uh, as part of a section of um, what broadly is called the harm report or kind of the analysis of the, uh, the, the problems we're trying to, to address. Um, I'm focused on the area of peoplehood, of the, the ways in which the, the dignity of African heritage people historically in the town of Amherst has been harmed. And, uh, and ways in which um, 
that our, our narratives, our historical narratives um, have been interrupted and, and held back. And as a part of that then, uh, of that overall report area that would go into informing our, our municipal plan, what we're charged, the plan we're charged with developing, my feeling is, is that uh, some select oral interviews with uh, not exclusively elders, but but because we could go for an, a, a, an intergenerational set. But I think a, a set of first person, first hand voices who can speak along the lines of what Alexis, how Alexis spoke at the, at the, 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 the town council meeting, you know, of, of direct, first-hand experiences will go a long way toward rounding out the kind of harm report that we want to have as part of the basis of the municipal plan we, we will put forward. So I have no problems with, I think along the lines of what folks said that we could, we could write up for this, apply for this, uh, envision a kind of micro set. We're not, in, um, you know, we're not positing uh, to do the kind of comprehensive oral history of African heritage people in in Amherst. In fact, we may, I may even have a sample inquiry letter from when uh, my partner D um, uh, recently received a grant, or a couple of years ago, back before the. The pandemic actually received a grant for creating some oral histories here in the town. I don't think it was through this mass humanities program, but was maybe through a cultural council. But again, some of the same information may be there, may be useful toward developing the inquiry letter. But but be that as it may, I think that if we could project a a set of interviews of three of four uh, that. Uh, we would all we would kind of discuss and target on the basis of what we're trying to show, um, you know, identify who those might be, and then have the funding through this grant to uh, uh, to commission uh, someone to uh, audio and perhaps vid visually record the that select group. Then that could complement the written piece of the report on the, the interruption of our historical narrative of our peoplehood that uh, uh, slavery and the, uh, uh, the years after slavery have, have, have wrought. I think that would round it out nicely. So uh, I don't think it takes us off point and I don't think that it, if it conceived in this way, I don't think it takes us off point. I think it fits in within the scope of the kind of reporting areas, one of the reporting areas that that will be a part of the of our work, that will then help to inform the overall plan that we're charged with. And so I think you know, thinking of it in that very limited set, we're not trying to you know create a corpus uh, 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 of, of of oral history interviews. We're trying to instead do a select set that could really speak to the kinds of harm that uh, to ourselves culturally as a people, as a, as a nation, uh, within a nation, that's that, that, that select group, that's where I think this could really fit in, meet the objectives of the Mass Humanities Grant, but then also fit in to our overall uh, charge and our overall work. That's my two cents. Thank you for articulating that uh, so well, Dr. Shabazz. That really, uh, I think that sounds great. Thanks to all of the input for around that because, um, wow, we're getting efficient as an assembly, I gotta say. <laughs> it's just like the trust that I feel with this group that like, no matter what, it's gonna, um, yeah, that that works. Um, I think, and and I think Alexis is what. So, it sounds to me. Let me just Jennifer. Are three people 
including if you wanted to be able to be there, if or would three people be fine for open meeting law in a set? Because we're seven actually, even though we don't have seven. Your quorum is four, right? Yeah, our quorum. Um, I you know I will check with Paul, but I mean if you're going to do three, I can just post the meeting. It's it's not that hard. I'd rather post it, but. Then you guys have to meet somewhere, or, or you'd have to meet via Zoom, and I would send you a link. We wouldn't have a quorum, though, right? Because there's only know, three of us. I know, and but sometimes they get really. Um, she means she would post a subcommittee. Yeah, so, a subcommittee oh, meeting because so it's three. Quorum would need wouldn't need to be the the four. It would be right, but, but what it would mean is that you'd have to do it as a public meeting, which means I could come and like do the opening pieces and then go, or someone else, I could hand over chair to somebody for that subcommittee. Cause you'd still have to Well, do No, the subcommittee would create their own chair. That's how we did it with CSWG. Oh, okay. And so anytime oh. they had more than three people at a meet three or more people at a meeting, we, we called it a subcommittee. I got That's it. That's why okay. the magic number was two two okay oh should i not come no i think the should i just there. come as no, a no. guest no you no. can't do that either that's not allowed <laughs> but i i think what could happen is yvonne depending on how eager you are i think that like alexis and holla could get things started or you and holla could get things started or two of you could get things started and then bring it out into the public in a public meeting that we would have. And then that sort of, you know, so it really depends. Um, a subcommittee is going to sort of add an extra layer of things that people have to track and follow and, and post for. And I think that they can become problematic, but, and we're also looking at a turnaround time here. That's pretty quick, like April 11th, which is, you know, two weeks from now. Um, so um, let me just ask each member, Alexis, how eager are you to sort of be working on this initially on the letter of intent? Um, so, sorry, let me just look at my calendar here. Um, so it's, it's due April 11th, right? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I am. I am eager. I have time next week. This week is bananas for me. Okay. But I have a lot of time next week um, before Friday. And um, yeah, but is it is it a situation where we can't even like work off of the same Google Drive, right? Yep. If there's if it if it's three, then we're getting to the point of where we have to if just two people holla, I was yep coming to you too. What, how eager do you feel to work on this? And I see Dr. Shabazz, your hand. I'm going to go holla and then Dr. Shabazz. I was going to say if there could be a preliminary draft, we could even start to discuss it maybe 10 minutes on the fourth yes. before we meet. And then we could do another meeting. I'm just that, yeah. So there could be like a, a rough draft and then Yvonne or Alexis who have ideas. Um, can either bring it and then we all start working on it differently but that was just a suggestion so would you be willing to do a rough draft and bring it for discussion at our next meeting on the fourth and then yes, i believe it can it also be placed in the the packet the the packet so people can have it ahead of time and yes and so we're meeting on the fourth, which is I don't I'm sorry I don't have a calendar in front of me. It's is Monday that next next Monday. Yeah. So then um, I have to post the meeting for Thursday. So if the draft I can have for Friday, and then I can put it Perfect. and then everybody can have it over the weekend. Is that enough time for folks? I you yeah. want to say Wednesday? I was like, I'll get it to you Wednesday. Well, I mean, even better as soon as possible. <laughs> but give yourself the space, yeah, because. The agenda is going to be super easy to post because um, we know what I can give it to Jennifer literally email to her after this meeting. So because what we'll do for the agenda for next week is we'll have the presentation of the black census given the Dunahue Institute can meet with us and we'll review this draft. And then on the 11th, what we'll do is we'll bring back the questions on the community survey for discussion and we'll approve the final document to be 
um, submitted that night by 11.59 PM on the Mass Humanities Grant. Does that work? Okay, Alexis and um, Yvonne, are you comfortable with that for that for that piece of things? Okay, thank Wait, you, Holla. So Holla will create a draft and then we're all gonna look at it next week. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess my concern would be that we're gonna review it again on the day it's due. And so we should decide who's submitting. Would that be you, Michelle? Sure, me or Jen, one of us will submit it. Um, but I think what we wanna make sure to do is on the 4th, if we need a subcommittee to meet between the 4th and the 11th, that we'll just make sure we do that so that it's not on the 11th that we're scrambling um, a few hours before it's due. Um, that way, the 11th, we're really doing a public final approval of the letter. And then one of us, myself or Jennifer, will submit it through the portal. Great. OK, awesome. All right, awesome. Well, it is 3.30 um, and there aren't any attendees in the, um, in the, uh, with us here. So we do not have to do public comment and there are no topics that I did not um, foresee being here. So if there are no other comments or questions, we can move to adjourn. I'll wait one minute though to make sure. Any hands? All right, this was a great meeting. Thank you all so much. Um, and adjourning at 331 and we'll see you next week. Bye. Bye everyone. <laughs>